right. All right. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for joining for the SSAT Advanced GI Fellowship Grand Rounds. My name is Imran Hassan. I'm I'm for full disclosure, colorectal surgeon. I'm just representing the, the board uh, of, uh, of the SSAT. Rohan J. Raja, who's the, the chair of this uh, group, he'll be joining in. Uh, he's in clinic right now. He just texted me to get things started. So we'll get a move along. It's a small group, so I'll just take the first name and if you could just introduce yourself briefly and then we'll kind of dive into things. One thing that Rohan always wants is to make sure to have this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, you can always put, use the emoji to, hand, to raise your hand or stop for a question so we can have a, a lively discussion, just kind of the main goal of this, more than just a one-way dis discord or discussion. So Dr. Omar, we'll start with you first. Hello, uh, my name is Mena. Um, I'm currently the Advanced GI Surgery Fellow at Thomas Jefferson, and I will be um, giving a talk today about revisional bariatric surgery. Dr. Hutter. Hi, my name is Matt Hutter. I'm a general GI bariatric surgeon at the Mass General Hospital in Boston. I'm the most recent past president from the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. All right. Thanks, Dr. Hutter. Uh, Dr. Tatarian. Hi, my name is uh, Talar Tatarian, and I'm the Associate Program Director for the Minimally Invasive Advanced GI Fellowship at uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. My practice is also general in bariatric surgery. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Chow. I do bariatric surgery at Penn Mass and Princeton Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Raymond. Okay, we can skip Dr. Jury. Dr. Raymond came off unmute. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, okay. uh, I'm Shlomi Raymond. I'm uh, the current uh, Advanced GI and HPV Fellow at uh, Advent Health Tampa. I'm sorry, we're also in the uh, middle of finishing up clinics, so I'll be joining uh, uh, probably in the middle. I'm sorry. No worries, sorry. take your time. Thanks again. Uh, Dr. Noll. That's okay. Dr. Sun. Hi, yeah, I'm Dr. Sun. I'm Advanced GI Fellow at Banner Gateway in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Devarai. Hi, I'm the Advanced GI Fellow at Penn Medicine Princeton Medical Center. Okay, uh, Dr. Zumpo. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a medical graduate, and I am applying for uh, general surgery uh, residency this summer. And currently, I'm doing research at the uh, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at the Department of Bariatrics. Okay, um, very happy to be here. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And Dr. Morales. That's okay. All right, I see Dr. Wells has joined in. We're just doing introductions for everybody, but I think we can, Dr. Welsh, again, thanks again for joining. Thank you, Dave Welsh, general surgeon from Batesville, also a member of the Board of Regents at the Marion College of Surgeons. All right, thanks again. All right, yes. I think we can get started. Well, Dr. Umar, you have the floor or the, the screen, whatever we have nowadays virtually. All right, Th thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to, Thank SSAT for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and let me know if my slides work. Okay. Um, all right, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so the goals of today's talk is to review um, major um, complications associated with um, common uh, bariatric uh, procedures. So I'll be starting uh, with reviewing the trends and the nomenclature and then go on to speak on common complications of uh, gastric banding, sleeve gastrectomy, and uh, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Um, so uh, as you can see here, this line graph, um, it um, shows the prevalence of obesity, um, uh, of obesity and severe obesity. And as you can see, it's been growing at a rapid uh, rate since the 1960s. Uh, as of 2018, uh, the um, estimate, it's an estimated 42% um, of adults have uh, obesity and 9% have severe, severe obesity. 
By 2030, the national prevalence of adult obesity uh, will increase to 48%. Uh, bariatric surgery uh, is a durable treatment uh, for obesity and its comorbidities. Uh, there has been an increase in the number of bariatric surgeries performed annually, as well as a shift in the surgical approach and the type of surgeries uh, being performed. Um, there has also been an increase in revisional surgeries. In 2011, 6% of all bariatric surgery was revisional. In 2018, revisional surgery compromised 15%. Um, and here you can see uh, the numbers as well. So to start with, um, I'll be talking about the adjust, uh, adjustable gastric band. So the number uh, of gastric bands performed in the U.S. has decreased since its peak in 2008, uh, and currently it makes up only 1% of bariatric procedures performed in the U.S. Um, complications of uh, the gastric band um, include erosion, slippage, um, weight regain, and ineffective uh, weight loss. So beginning with erosion, um, the incidence of erosion um, is 0.6 to 14%. Uh, diagnosis is difficult to elicit. Uh, patients often uh, present with just vague abdominal pain uh, and weight regain. Uh, endoscopy is the diagnostic tool of choice um, and a portion or all of the band would, will be visualized within the lumen um, as you can see in this picture right here. Uh, so the treatment uh, is removal with possible conversion uh, to another uh, procedure. And then, uh, and then this removal can be performed surgically or endos and, and endos endoscopically or a combination of the both. Um, here is um, a single center experience uh, with eroded um, band uh, removal. Um, so for endoscopic removal, they use ERCP guide wire and a mechanical lithotripter for band transection and snare removal. And they concluded that minimally invasive endoscopic approach for gastric band uh, erosion is successful without the need for further surgical intervention. Um, and this is the algorithm uh, they had um, uh, suggested. And here's a video uh, showing laparoscopic uh, transgastric band removal. Uh, so as you can see, upon entry uh, to the abdomen, there are adhesions to the abdominal wall. You can see the band tubing. Um, and then here we use a harmonic device uh, to create an anterior gastrotomy, uh, just distal to the band capsule. Through the gastrotomy, you can see the eroded uh, gastric band. The band is, is grasped and then eventually cut with um, sharp scissors and completely removed. It's removed with the, the buckle and its tubing. And then the um, anterior gastrotomy is then closed here in two layers using uh, absorbable uh, 2 v lock. The benefit of doing, um, doing it this way is that you don't have to disrupt uh, or suture uh, through scarred um, tissue, so you don't. And then after doing so, the entry point of the band capsule was then also oversewn, and uh, a leak test performed as well. All right. Um, so moving on to uh, slippage. So the incidence of band slippage or gastric prolapse is between 0.4 to 13%. Um, this often causes uh, pouch dilatation and, um, and leads to weight regain, um, reflux, and even obstructive symptoms. 
uh, upper GI fluoroscopy confirms a diagnosis. Uh, and um, the phi angle can also be measured uh, on abdominal x-ray. The phi angle is the angle between um, the longitudinal axis of the band and the spinal column. Oh. All right. Um, so the initial treatment after you diagnose uh, slippage is band uh, deflation, uh, but ultimately surgery will be required. Um, so repositioning or rebuckling can be performed laparoscopically and involves unbuckling uh, the band, uh, reducing the herniated stomach and then rebuckling the band in proper position. Uh, this approach though has a high rate of slippage recurrence. Uh, band removal with replacement um, through a newly created retrogastric tunnel has better results uh, and can be offered to patients who already have had successful weight loss with um, gastric banding. In patients that um, have had ineffective weight loss, however, or weight regain, uh, conversion to a different bariatric procedure is recommended. So with regards to um, weight regain, this is one of the main reasons uh, for the decrease in gastric uh, banding, uh, basically the poor long-term uh, uh, weight loss results. So at five years after surgery, approximately 40% require another surgery for weight loss. And at seven years, 43%, only 43 will achieve 50% excess weight loss. So for patients that present with weight regain, the first step is to confirm that the gastric band is functioning properly. Uh, the next thing is that the patient's diet and lifestyle should be carefully reviewed. Uh, and if um, the weight uh, regain or significant obesity still remains, conversion to different procedures should be discussed with the patient. So conversion options include sleep gastrectomy, ruin Y gastric bypass and duodenal switch. Uh, conversion to these procedures has higher complication rates uh, than primary sleep gastrectomy or gastric bypass. And there continues to be a debate over one or two stage operation. Um, here I have um, a few studies, uh, the first of which uh, compared um, the uh, two stage uh, versus, sorry, one stage versus two stage laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy um, after a gastric band. Uh, and it found no differences in complications, weight loss, or quality of life. Uh, another retrospective multi center review showed similar, no difference in post operative complications and mortality rates, um, showing that both are safe and feasible. And here's another. Um, a systematic review and uh, meta-analysis uh, that showed the safety of one step as well as two step uh, approach with comparable complications, morbidity uh, and uh, mortality. And similarly, this is another, um, and this is another uh, study showing the safety of single versus two stage conversion of gastric band to gastric bypass or sleeve and it showed that single stage conversion was associated with lower morbidity and conversion to sleeve gastrectomy safer, safer than um, ruin Y gastric um, bypass. Um, so moving on to sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, so this is the most commonly performed bariatric uh, procedure. Um, certain complications such as leak or stricture are more common after revisional sleeve than a primary sleeve gastrectomy. Um, moving to complications, so uh, leak has an incidence uh, of 1.5%, but can range from 0.5 to 5%. It mostly occurs due to distal obstruction, narrowing, twisting, um, or ischemia. Uh, patients will classically, classically present with abdominal pain, fever, sepsis, uh, CT and upper GI fluoroscopy are um, imaging modalities that can help us detect a leak and help guide us uh, with our uh, management. So the tenets uh, of leak management is treatment of sepsis, 
uh, as well as nutritional uh, support. Uh, depending on the timing of the leak, source control is typically obtained um, by percutaneous endoscopic or operatively placed drains. Um, early leak and hemodynamic instability warrant an urgent return to the operating room. Uh, for early leak in a stable patient, there is some debate. Uh, patients can be taken to the OR uh, for the hope to oversow the leak and also can be managed conservatively with percutaneous or endoscopic drainage. For uh, stable patients with late leaks, these are often managed conservatively through percutaneous or endoscopic means. But regardless of the approach um, to leak management, the underlying cause of the leak should be addressed to allow for proper healing. So for example, if there's evidence of distal obstruction, obstruction at the incisura, there, this could, should be treated either surgically or endoscopically, whether with gastropexy, stenting, or balloon dilatation. So um, on average, a leak resolves in about 40 to 61 days, uh, and literature reports rates of operative intervention between 27 and 61%. And this is mostly dictated by surgeon preference. Um, conversion to ruin white gastric bypass can be performed as the initial treatment for the leak or at later procedures in patients with chronic fistula. Uh, proximal leaks near the G junction may require conversion to ruin Y esophagojejunostomy or ruin Y fistulojejunostomy. Um, in the latter technique, uh, after debridement of the fistula, a rule limb is fashioned to the fistula followed by creation of a jejunostomy, and this allows for the creation of a low pressure system with a closed uh, system for the leak. Moving on to uh, stricture. Um, so strictures can occur anytime post-operatively. Uh, the incidence is one uh, to 3.5%. Uh, upper GI fluoroscopy or endoscopy are helpful in identifying the location and the extent um, of the stenosis. Uh, stricture is uh, due to luminal narrowing or torsional scarring. So th this is related um, to technical issues with the sleeve's creation. Um, so like creating two narrow of a sleeve, uh, poor staple alignment, over-aggressive suturing of the staple line, or unintentional rotation of the staple line anteriorly, posteriorly. Stenosis can also develop as a byproduct uh, of a leak as well. In symptomatic uh, patients, um, endoscopic interventions are the cornerstone of uh, treatment. Uh, these include balloon or, pneuman or pneumatic dilatation or even stent placement. Um, this has a success rate of up to 90%. And self-expanding metal stents may also be used, uh, sorry, for endoscopic dilatation that has a success rate of up to 90%. And uh, self-expanding metal stents can also be used if dilatation fails or if there's distal stenosis. And then for refractory cases, uh, conversion to ruin Y gastric bypass is the treatment of choice. So here's a video um, showing a treatment of uh, gastric, acute gastric torsion uh, following a sleeve gastrectomy. And here you can see there's narrowing and twisting of the stomach, making it difficult to manipulate the scope and get it to pass distal to that area. And then after market manipulation, it event eventually can get to the distal stomach. And here a uh, guide wire is being passed. And then a, a fully covered self-expandable metal stent is placed as you can see right there.
So Dr. Omar, I have a question to the group here. Um, in my practice, I routinely uh, do a intraoperative endoscopy after performing a sleeve gastrectomy. A, that was our practice and fellowship, but B, I've seen two cases of acute gastric torsion um, immediately with insufflation of the gastric sleeve. So the way that changed our management was to, you know, perform a gastropexy at the time of the initial sleeve gastrectomy. Um, does anybody else in their practice, those that practice bariatrics, do routine endoscopy after sleeve? I used to. I used to use the uh, use the large um, uh, scope, a therapeutic scope, and use it as a bougie. And I've gone away from that. I now use the Visi G. And uh, when, but when we were using it, I would always look for bleeding. I'd always look for torsion, and never saw it. Um, and it really simplifies the case. Not a, from the nursing standpoint, not having to do the endoscopy, not having to go up to the head of the bed, not having the nurses clean it, and all that. So, so I've moved to using. I use the Visi G, uh, which is the the um, the uh, bougie that I use. And that's uh, I don't related do, uh, to and see how it looks. So. I, I don't do endoscopy, but I routinely do a mental vaccine. So I don't know if that had an effect, but I've, I've never seen torsion, period. And I, I always pex it. So. It's always so interesting to me that one of the most common procedures performed in bariatrics, yet there's so much variation, you know, in the way people perform it, test it, et cetera. So um, just a point that I thought was worth discussing. So I had a question on this video. So how does the stent prevent the torsion? And is that a long-term solution or not? It, it's a short, short term. The stent is placed for uh, about two weeks. Um, well, sorry, it is a long-term, sorry. My bad. It's a short-term stent. Um, it allows for remodeling of the tissue. Um, and usually it remains in place for about two weeks. And in this case, after two weeks, the stent was removed and a repeat upper GI showed that contrast was now able to pass with the stent out of place. Um, but in some cases, um, you know, there's too much scarring at that point, or it's too much of an angulation, or it's more of a, you know, too much of a strictured area at that point, in which case conversion is absolutely necessary. Do you do a balloon dilatation before you put the stent in or, or just the stent? Um, it, if it's just narrowing, um, we generally do try to do the balloon dilation first. In this one, it was more of a twist, so we went straight to stent. So this is, this is Rohan. I'm sorry to be jumping on late, but sometimes, you know, you don't have a clear torsion, but you have a relative high pressure zone and this will present more as reflux than anything else. How do you all, and you may be getting there, uh, Dr. Omar, but how do you, how do you all uh, kind of figure that out? Because unfortunately, Dallas is a very interesting area in that a lot of people do sleeves, but not many of the sleeves are followed up. And so a lot of these patients will show up with terrible, terrible reflux and a, and a sort of somewhat of an hourglass deformity with sort of a a uh, clover leaf that's you know bulging out more proximally. Is there other any tips that you can give us, Matt or Dr. Tatarian? It's as if you just got a peek into my clinic from last week. I had a patient just like this who um, has that hourglass shape. I can clearly see the narrowing at the incisura. What I did was I reviewed the, the video images from the video swallow to see where I thought the hangup was going. Is there actual slowdown? or reflux that we're seeing at that point of the incisura. And in this patient's case, um, there was not. Um, so I didn't think, you know, just dilating that area was necessarily going to help too much. I also discussed it with the patient and said, I don't think we'll burn any bridges by attempting a dilation, but I think at the end, all roads are gonna lead to bypass. And that's ultimately what she voted for. Matt? Anyway. Yeah, uh, reflux after sleep, definitely an issue. Learning more from um, Genko's study and studies from Italy and other areas in, in Europe that the risk of Barrett's esophagus, esophagitis is real. And so I think these things we're going to really have to keep a close eye on. Creating the sleeve, you know, what the sleeve looks like later on is certainly an issue. Narrowing the incisura is, is a problem. Some people talk about uh, dilating there in order to help with that. Um, but at the end of the day, and people talk about fixing hiatal hernias and keeping the sleeve. At the end of the day, if it's really a problem, the bypass and hiatal hernia repair is the best definitive option. And I wouldn't muck around too much because that works very well. It's hard because a lot of these people didn't want to bypass to begin with. That's why they had a sleeve. And, uh, and so it, that can be a tough pill to swallow. 
Yeah, that's a perfect segue to, to the next topic. Um, so yeah, so speaking of uh, reflux and hiatal hernia, so the reflux of, um, sorry, the incidence of uh, de novo GERD uh, after um, sleeve gastrectomy is about 23% and Barrett's esophagus um, incidence of that is 6.8%. Um, so this is likely, reflux is likely caused by changes in pressure dynamics of the GE junction uh, with blunting or removal of the angle of his. Um, other complications such as leak or stricture can increase the intragastric pressure and result in worsening reflux. Um, so for these patients, uh, they all need a thorough workup, um, including endoscopy, 24-hour pH monitoring, barium swallow, uh, esophageal manometry, and then further assessment should be done for hiatal hernia, uh, retained or dilated gastric fundus, stricture formation, as we were talking about, uh, and severe um, angulation of the stomach of the inchisura. Um, so that should all be uh, done. So uh, initial treatment is PPIs and close follow-up, and then in cases of that are refractory to medical management, uh, surgical um, intervention should be offered. Uh, corrective surgery can be considered, such as hiatal hernia repair or Lynx procedure. And then for those um, who uh, do require additional weight loss or conversion to Renoir gastric bypass is the treatment of choice uh, in, those, um, in that patient population. So, um, so weight regain and effective uh, weight loss after sleep gastrectomy. Um, the definition is, is of weight regain is not uniform, so it's generally difficult to measure. However, up so to- before we, uh, before we get off that topic, can I, I don't know if you're gonna go yeah, back hard. to reflux after yeah. sleep, but I, so again, just to ask the group, sort of how do you decide on somebody who's coming in with, reflux is one of their symptoms and are obese as to which procedure to do. Matt, do you want to help us with that? Because obviously there's some data that the weight loss itself will help with reflux, but I've always felt that reflux is a relative contraindication to a sleeve, but uh, I know that around the country that's certainly not the case because I see those patients in clinic. <laughs> And this is this is a more challenging thing, uh, partly because patients really want a sleeve, or a lot of them do, and and so sometimes it's hard. It really depends on that specific patient, their symptoms, and the care. If they have warning signs or bad signs, then making sure they have an endoscopy so you know if they have esophagitis, you know if they have Barrett's. To me, it's a contraindication to do a a, a, a sleeve in someone who has Barrett's. I think they should get a bypass. But with people with esophagitis or just quite symptomatic then it's a discussion uh, for sure. But at the end of the day, some of the people, and you know, some people who have sleeves, it gets better with weight loss. Some people, it, it gets, it, you know, it, it can come back um, later on as well. So it's some people who de novo, like mentioned, they, they develop when they never had it before and some people it gets worse. So it's, it's a pretty big flip of the corn, but it's a, it's a detailed discussion. And that's probably spend more time on that and sending people away saying, well, you know, why don't you think about it? We're not going to do consent today. You think about it and um, and maybe let's get the endoscopy, get some more definitive information, sometimes even doing further studies, you know, pH probe manometry, like I would for a reflux patient, just to try to have a more informed discussion. But at the end of the day, a lot of them are probably better off having a sleeve uh, because of their other comorbidities and all the other benefits. It's not, it's not a one issue thing. And so you have to have that informed, informed consent. Just a comment also about the Barrett's issue. So Dr. Tatarian, you know, one of the issues is now we're seeing all this, all these cancers in Barrett's post-sleeve and we don't have a conduit. So, you know, we're stuck with you needing to use colon. And again, there are not that many people around anymore that know how to use colon. So do you want to comment on that? Yes. So because the, uh, you know, the majority of the fundus and body of the stomach have been taken away, you don't have that as your conduit for esophagectomy. Um, so we, here at Jefferson, we've been doing a lot more colonic interpositions, not a ton, you know, but we have a couple a year that have been coming through. Um, and I think it's going to become more and more of a problem because, you know, as we saw in that first graph, you know, the number of sleeves really started going up about a decade ago. And just now we're starting to see that uptick in Barrett. So I do think that there's going to be more to come in the next 10, 20 years from that. 
Um, but our patients are smart. You know, they're seeing these data um, and they're even coming to me now saying, hey, I have GERD, I don't wanna sleep, I wanna bypass. Um, so I think the pendulum is switching back in the other direction. Um, I agree with everything Dr. Hutter said. Um, you know, I, I work up my patients very similarly. I have started getting upper GIs more routinely um, to assess for any type of esophageal dysmotility to see, is that going to change my decision-making in any way? Um, if I see it, if I see a lot of tertiary contractions, you know, maybe get a formal manometry, you know, if the patient really um, doesn't want a bypass. But then also if the patient says, absolutely not under no situation, would I want my sleeve converted to a bypass? There's been two or three patients like that that I've turned away and said, you know, I'm sorry, I think you're too high risk for problems with GERD after the, afterwards. I won't do your bariatric procedure. And I'm happy to refer you for a second or third opinion. I definitely want to highlight, those are great points, um, Talar. And I, I would definitely want to highlight the, the, um, the idea if they have any like dysphagia or anything like that, you really don't want to do a sleeve if they have esophageal dysmotility because you're 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 putting that esophagus up against a high pressure system, just like a band, not maybe not as bad as a band, but similar a concept. And so that's that's really a warning sign from my standpoint, not just the reflux, but people who, you know, who have this kind of nausea, vomiting, gagging, regurgitation, or other symptoms related to that. And just just to cause chest pain for the group. Every now and then I'll see a sleeve with a nissen. <laughs> Not for my yeah. patients. Uh, you know, I think, I think that's a, that's a little, that uh, is probably more surgery and not really what you're trying to do. You're creating a high pressure system and then you're trying to do a wrap. I do think with the sleeve, you know, you, some, some say you destroy part of the GE junction, the sling fibers from that standpoint, repairing a, a, a hiatal hernia in the situation. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to see that, con, that sleeve not just slipping right back up through that hiatal hernia, no matter what you do, even if you're pexied, I get concerned about that. So um, these are certainly an issues. I'm not a fan, to be honest, of, of doing that. I think you're, you're, uh, you're, creating, you're probably creating more problems than when you have a perfectly good fix, which is a gastric bypass. So that's why it's one of the reasons why people need to feel comfortable doing a safe bypass. So you can look them in the eye and say, no, I know I can do it safely and you'll be better off and believe yourself when you say that. And, and, and to be, and Dr. Tarian, to be, to be clear that fundus should be gone, right? When you do the sleep. Right. No, but they intentionally keep it for that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry to interrupt Dr. Omar. No, I want to think about like perhaps the angulation of the stomach after the pouch dilates. I mean, there were some studies that looked at pouch dilation proximal distal, like uh, Dr. Sitarian said, and usually there's always a narrowing, but you, you ever think about perhaps the angle of the, the bulge, you know, going like lateral versus medial and kind of making a Z shape versus like, I think like I'm a big believer in domental pexy just because it kind of forces the shape of the stomach versus having the stomach be pretty straight and then dilates later and then become kind of a, a Z shape or a lightning bolt shape. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. I, I, ha I haven't looked specifically into that, but like Dr. Hutter had mentioned, we have seen some acute herniation. So if the patient has a hiatal hernia and you're doing a sleeve, maybe those are the ones that, you know, if they don't want to bypass, those are the ones that should definitely, you know, consider getting an omentopexy um, to prevent the herniation, the angulation, the reflux, et cetera. Um, I haven't seen any studies specifically looking at it, but it's definitely an interesting question. Good discussion. Yeah. Mena, we're stealing your thunder and I think we have. No, you're good. This oh, is good. wonderful. Um, yeah, so moving on to um, weight regain and, and effective uh, weight loss. Uh, so uh, this is, um, again, up to 35% of patients undergo conversion procedures uh, for weight regain. Uh, so depending on the degree of weight loss desired and underlying comorbidities, conversion to an anastomotic procedure can be uh, considered after an attempt at lifestyle modification and medically supervised uh, weight loss. Uh, so here the question is, uh, you know, uh, after a sleeve gastrectomy for these patients that, um, is it better 
uh, to switch them to the duodenal switch or, uh, sorry, convert them to the duodenal switch or a gastric um, bypass. Um, so this paper compar compar compares conversion of sleeve to the duodenal switch versus um, gastric bypass. Uh, excess weight loss was greater for the duodenal switch group uh, compared to the gastric bypass group. Uh, duodenal switch patients, however, were more likely to develop short-term complications uh, and vitamin deficiencies. Uh, patients that did have GERD and dysphagia complaints prior to uh, their secondary surgery um, uh, and underwent gastric bypass had resolution um, of those um, symptoms. And then uh, this is a systematic review uh, a meta-analysis um, that compares the efficacy and safety between the duodenal switch uh, and uh, gastric bypass as a revisional procedure for the sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, so the duodenal switch group actually is achieved a higher percentage of uh, total uh, weight loss compared to the gastric bypass group. However, there were no significant um, differences in length of stay or adverse events or uh, improvement in comorbidities between the two groups. Um, so anyone have any thoughts uh, on this topic? Um, I mean, obviously a duodenal switch is gonna produce a lot more malabsorption, but I mean, has anyone kind of looked at the long-term results and like osteopenia and other things in this group? Um, think. No, we, we don't comment specifically on this, but, you know, I think th there had been a lot of studies, you know, with, with the shorter common channel, definitely much higher rates. I think now the general consensus has come to making it about a 250 to 300 centimeter common channel. And with that, the rates of um, protein deficiencies, malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, osteopenia, et cetera, is under 5%. So depending on the patient, it has become a safer and more reasonable option. Um, the way we've started counseling our patients is that if after sleeve gastrectomy, their BMI is in the 50 range, um, we at least have the discussion of a duodenal switch or SADI procedure with them. Um, and honestly, more so now, if they're coming to us just for their primary operation with a BMI in the 50s, uh, we're more likely to push an anastomotic procedure to at least give some of that malabsorption. So either a gastric bypass off the bat, or at least have that in their mind of this may need to be a two-stage procedure. This is a great discussion. And I think we could, we could, we could spend the rest of the hour talking yeah. about a lot of this. Um, the, you know, SADI is a newer procedure that's, that's approved. It was always approved as a revisional operation, but also for primary, but also the OAGB. In uh, Shlomi, I think you mentioned OAGB before. I don't have a lot of experience, nor do a lot of people in the United States, but OAGB may be a good option for these. And then when you start throwing in the reflux uh, issue too, then do they have reflux plus weight regain or ineffective weight loss? And, and then it becomes a much more nuanced discussion. And I think a longer limb gastric bypass is, is something that people are doing with, uh, with good effect as well now that people are tolerating um, some of these more quote unquote malabsorptive operations. So it is a, it's a, it's a ripe for future discussion. Would love to see people do um, uh, further studies in order to look at it and hopefully we'll learn from each other's experiences too. But a lot of these people wanted sleeves because they liked the simplicity. They didn't want the malabsorption. The malabsorptive operations, uh, the BPDDS is 0.6 to 1% of the operations in the US right now. So there isn't a huge appetite, excuse the pun, for those operations. So I think it's this is a lot we have yet to learn about this. I'm sorry, Matt, I missed the beginning of this, but did we already go over the abbreviations that you're referring to? Um, let's see, there's some listed here, not OAGB. One in asthmosis gastric bypass, the other one is Sadie, so you there. And yeah. do you have any pictures of that, Dr. Omar, just for the group that is not bariatric? Oh, no, I apologize. No, that's fine, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to make sure. The other thing, just to ask this group, is considering that most of most of the revisional procedures can be done after sleep, can the sleep be considered a first step? That's how it was developed uh, initially, was the first step before a BPD-DS actually, and people didn't, then didn't go for the second stage. Um, so that was one of the first 
ways that the sleeve is actually developed. So yes, and some people think it can. Now this gets challenging because a lot of insurance companies have one and done policies where you can only do one operation. The combined operations have a much more morbidity. Um, so a re revisional or a reoperative surgery has a much higher complication rate for a lot of different reasons. And so it's something to be thought about and the resources involved as well. And so I think it's one of those things where you're better off doing it well once. However, it's nice having options and you don't have your hands tied where in a bypass you have, you, there aren't as many options afterwards. Second of all, does anyone ever consider JI as a bridge in a super, super obese patient? Not done. No. I'm showing my age. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, they learned a lot with regards to nutritional complications and the liver failure related to it. So the, uh, the, the closest thing we have are these with, with these, um, these really short common channels that, that have been done. But as, as uh, Dr. Chatarian talked about before, they've now you know, backed up some of that so to try to avoid some of those more malabsorptive issues and leaving blind loops. All right. Um, so moving on to our gastric bypass. Um, so right now, gastric bypass is approximately 17% of primary bariatric surgeries. Uh, and then secondary gastric bypass procedures do actually have a higher rate of complications compared to primary and uh, uh, compared to primary gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. So these are some of the complications. Um, for gastric uh, bypass, so starting with anastomotic leak. Um, after gastric bypass, it occurs mostly at the GJ, uh, less frequently at the JJ. Uh, upper GI, fluoroscopy and CT is diagnostic modality of choice. And um, as we talked about with the, with the leak after sleep, the tendons of management, again, focus on sepsis management and nutritional support. Um, so depending on timing and location as well, um, the uh, intervention options include operative washout drainage, uh, anastomotic repair versus revision, endoscopic drainage, stenting, repair, and percutaneous um, drainage. Um, next complication, so for internal hernias, um, so early obstruction after Roux-en-Y gastric bypass uh, occurs about 0.5 to 1.7. Uh, An overall incidence of obstruction is about three to four percent after gastric bypass. CT with oral contrast is a diagnostic tool of choice. Uh, generally, in this patient population, um, they should get a more aggressive surgical uh, approach. Uh, the, in early obstruction, the most common site of obstruction is at the JJ, uh, usually due to kinking or narrowing of the anastomosis. Um, and if this should occur, it should prompt early reoperation, um, particularly if there is a dilated uh, BP limb or gastric uh, remnant. And here I have a picture, actually, of a patient we recently had who had um, early um, post-op obstruction uh, after ruin Y gastric bypass. Um, and then for late obstruction, um, the source is typically adhesive disease or internal hernia. And um, here is a um, um, paper um, or a study that evaluated the reliability of CT scans for detection of internal hernia in the gastric bypass uh, population. Uh, the sensitivity of CT scans to detect internal hernia was 76% and the specificity 60%. And when combining CT scans with neutrophilia, the sensitivity increased to 90%. Um, so in general, for the, this patient population, the obstructive patient with gastric history of gastric bypass, there should be a very low threshold to perform diagnostic laparoscopy um, in general. Dr. Omar, I'm just gonna interject there for one second since we have a lot of people on the call that aren't necessarily bariatric surgeons, uh, depending on your practice, you're going to see patients in the ER that have had a gastric bypass before. Um, so the points I would drive home with that is don't just rely on the CT and say, oh, the CT didn't show an internal hernia, it's fine. Have a very low threshold to at least stick a scope in and explore if you feel comfortable uh, doing that laparoscopically. Um, dilated loops in a patient with a gastric bypass generally in my mind warrants exploration. Um, tenderness on exam, if they haven't been explored before, warrants exploration. 
And then my practice is if I'm going in to do a gallbladder on someone after their gastric bypass surgery, I turn the scope around and I look at their defects and I'll document like defects are closed. Once they've lost their weight and those defects have closed, generally they remain closed. Um, so that if they then come back in afterwards, I can at least say, oh, look, you know, I've, I've looked in this belly before and I know that it was closed so I can rest a little better knowing that that's most likely not the problem, but. I love that, Dr. Tatarian. I think not enough people do that, which is looking for the the, um, the the internal hernia sites and documenting them with the gallbladders later on. And I think that's definitely a better practice. Concern being a lot of people don't close the um, with the anti-colic, anti-gastric rule limbs with gastric bypasses. They purposely don't close that um, uh, that mesentery defect. And, and I think that that's something to consider as well. And so if you do see that it's open, you don't necessarily want to go fiddling with that if they're otherwise asymptomatic, um, because you can actually create a problem as well. Great point. All right. All right. So um, marginal ulcers um, are a well-documented complication of uh, Renoir gastric bypass. The incidence is uh, 6.5% uh, risk factors include NSAID use, H. pylori, tobacco use, alcohol use, a large gastric pouch, um, steroid use, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, if refractory to medical management, a surgical intervention is warranted. Uh, corrective surgeries include a resection and revision of the GJ anastomosis with excision of the uh, ulcer, and then for severe refractory cases, um, reversal should be considered. Uh, and then um, additionally, in the very, very severe cases, even a total gastrectomy with esophageal J um, can, pre can be performed as well. Uh, for the perforated uh, marginal uh, ulcers, uh, this is a surgical emergency and the incidence is about 1%. Uh, historically, uh, the corrective surgery of choice was exploratory laparotomy with, you know, washout and revision of the gastrojejunostomy. Um, now, uh, open laparoscopic, uh, open or laparoscopic mental patch repair has been shown to be safe and the preferred approach in these patients. Uh, there has been uh, shorter, it's been shown that it it has shorter operative times and hospital lengths of stay. Uh, however, once the patient does recover from uh, this acute event, medical management should be attempted. And then if uns unsuccessful, then a corrective surgery should be considered at that point. Um, so uh, this is an interesting- Mena, sorry, uh, Dr. Omar, let's just pause for one second. Another mm -hmm. teaching pearl there. Um, I know when I was a resident, I thought, oh, you just revise the GJ, not in the acute setting, you know, just treat it like a perforated ulcer. If it was a duodenal ulcer or a gastric ulcer, um, unless you have almost a full blowout of the anastomosis. Um, and then in that case, you really want to think like, um, can I actually redo this anastomosis in the acute setting? And chances are, if it's that bad, probably not. Um, and then you just want to drain, drain, drain. So drain in the gastric pouch, drain in the rule limb, drain in the remnant stomach, um, and then come back, you know, once all that inflammation and everything is healed up and um, reconstruct them, reverse them, et cetera. Um, but usually it's more of a pinpoint perforation. So one quick question. So when you say you're doing a mental patch, so is it like a gram patch and like, and even there's a gram patch and there's a modified gram patch. The classic gram patch was you leave the hole and put the patch on top of it, versus sometimes you, you close the hole in the duodenum and then put the patch on top. So when you have a JJ perforation, do you recommend closing it and then putting the patch on top or just putting the patch on top of the, of the hole and just swing around it? Or does it make a difference? I've done it as more of a pseudo modified gram patch. I use an absorbable suture, um, put them in as interrupted sutures and lay, you know, without tying them down, then bring the omentum over it and tie it down that way. Um, Dr. Hutter, do you have any tips for that? I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way to do the, you know, as was described by Graham. Um, but I think uh, as you described, 
a lot of people do this modified because they feel better just putting it together a little bit more than uh, than just stuffing omentum into it. But I would I would echo what you're saying. There's there's very little or almost no role for a, in do, redoing an anastomosis in the acute setting, um, and come back another day and fight that battle when the patient's not sick, and you'll have a much better chance to do that because you only have one more crack at that area uh, before you're doing an esophagectomy. Um, all right. Can I, may I just ask uh, one question, which as far as complications go, I, I see a rash of patients these days, post-gastric bypass that has sent to me for hypoglycemia and insulinoma and wanting me to take out part of their pancreas, which of course I'm not going to do. But, um, you know, with somebody who's got profound dumping and despite dietary um, changes, Dr. Hutter, do you just reverse those patients or... What is your algorithm? I think it's very rarely that you actually have to reverse them. It's definitely been described, um, but um, but I think with dietary modifications, with other medications as well, um, that can help mitigate the uh, the glycemic response. Most people can do a lot better. So with the awareness of it as well, having them have a you know glucometer. Sometimes it can be hard to get approval for a glucometer since they're not quote unquote diabetic. But uh, so that they can know and get feedback on what is what their situation is to avoid those symptoms can be best. But reversal is not a it's not going back to normal anatomy. That stomach does not work well. You denervated the entire thing. So yes, you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but it's not going to squeeze and digest the way it's supposed to. And weight regain is real, um, and so that's an issue. You have comorbidity recurrence, and uh, and weight regain can be a problem too. Right. Thank you for that. So um, this is um, an interesting uh, study out of an institution that's currently in press. Um, we compared uh, the incidence of marginal ulcer after a primary ruin y gastric bypass, gastric ba banding to a gastric bypass and sleeve uh, to gastric uh, bypass. Uh, out of 860 patients, 5.8% of patients uh, developed a marginal uh, ulcer. Uh, the incidence of marginal ulcer uh, was significantly higher for patients uh, undergoing uh, sleeve uh, to gastric bypass um, at an incidence of 11.8%. Uh, median time uh, to marginal ulcer was significantly shorter for patients who underwent sleeve um, to gastric bypass by approximately 14 months. Uh, and interestingly, among those who developed marginal ulcer, there wasn't any difference uh, in H. pylori status, NSAID, steroid, or tobacco used irrespective of the uh, operation performed. Um, so this suggests that there's an increased risk of ulceration that may be related to the inherent physiological or anatomic differences between the two procedures such as larger pouch sides, retained fundus, or per perfusion. Um, an alternative explanation may be uh, that the smaller remnant stomach mimics a retained antrum uh, syndrome with hypersecretion of gastrin, um, and we're currently prospectively studying this proposed pathology. Um, so this was something that anecdotally, um, we had started noticing that it seemed like these patients that had had a sleeve converted to a bypass were either getting worse ulcers, more refractory ulcers, or higher rates of them. So we combined with a couple other institutions to look at our outcomes. And we did see that irrespective of anastomosis type, you know, risk factors, you know, these patients are getting higher and faster rates to this ulcer formation. And we don't completely know why we have some ideas. Um, so we are studying this whole retained antrum syndrome um, by checking, you know, gastrin levels pre-op six months and 12 months post-op. So more data to come on that. Um, but also being more meticulous that when we're converting that sleeve over to a bypass, making sure that we don't have a big fundus that's left over um, and we're not giving the patient a larger pouch than we would have had we been doing a primary gastric bypass. Um, just be interested to hear if anybody else had any similar experience or thoughts about this. Interesting observation. I'm glad you're backing it up with science. Um, and and it would just be hypothesis, but I have heard a lot of people who are concerned about the size of the pouch, not only the, the posterior fundus or the, and the, the lateral fundus, but also with regards to the length 
after a, a sleeve conversion. So I think people have found in some of the bypasses before that when they had ulcer issues by making a smaller pouch, it seemed to improve. Um, but, but that is somewhat anecdotal as well, too. So I'm glad you're looking at it. It'd be interesting to see what the gastrin levels uh, look like in that situation. So uh, let us know. We'll see. Maybe next year or in a couple. All right. Uh, for the sake of uh, time, um, I'll be ending this talk. Uh, uh, so just kind of to conclude, um, there's been an increase in the number of revisional surgeries performed um, to manage acute and chronic post-operative complications. Uh, surgeons uh, must be comfortable with recognizing these complications and refer uh, to bariatric uh, specialists for appropriate workup and revisional surgery when indicated. Um, and just as I end, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Tatarian um, for her support, men mentorship, and guidance uh, throughout this year. Um, thank you. We'll take any questions. Bravo, Dr. Omar. Very well done. And uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Rohan, thanks for stirring the pot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, just to be frank, uh, David Welsh, you know, brought up this point because we tend to see these patients in the ED uh, when they show up. Uh, Dallas is a very interesting area in that many of the bariatric surgeons don't have inpatient privileges at any hospitals. And so they do sleeves in an outpatient center. And so we end up seeing these patients, unfortunately, with leaks and various things. Um, I, I did want to ask that in, this, in the patient that has sort of a chronic posterior perforated, you know, sealed off ulcer that is refractory to everything <laughs> in a gastric bypass. I mean, this is just terrible to deal with because you're looking at, you know, sort of if you can get to stomach, great, but otherwise it's an EJ. Uh, Dr. Tatarian, any hints for that patient? I mean, obviously, nutrition, 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 but. Um, I, I'm almost ashamed to say I don't necessarily trust the patient fully, and I'll still check, you know, nicotine, contine levels just to be sure that there is no smoking or even secondhand exposure that's driving up their levels. Um, but other than that, you know, GJ revision, consider a vagotomy. Um, if this whole retained antrum syndrome thing is real, maybe a remnant gastrectomy, but that's not benign either. It, it's a it's a tricky, tricky problem, but be prepared for the EJ if it's yeah. necessary. Yeah. Dr. Hutter? I, I would agree. That is that is a problem. Um, and um, and just revising the GJ alone without fixing something else or revising in a way that's going to change something with regards to the acid exposure is just fraught for the continued problems. Um, so yes, vagotomy. Uh, yes, looking at other factors that could be contributing here and the old open gastric bypass. We have a fair ga number of gastrogastric fistulas um, because we see that with the staple line breaks down. So that's another thing that you can attack. Uh, but it can be dicey and the posterior erosion can go right into the splenic artery. Um, so, you know, we say, oh, you know, bleeding or whatever, but it's, we've definitely seen that where um, that posterior erosion goes into the splenic artery and it's a red out. It is a trauma situation. So something to always have in the back of your mind. And just to bring up Dr. Welsh's last point over here, which is what dietary poor choices uh, contribute to often to marginal ulcers. And with that, just the question of, do you all believe that sweet eaters and non-sweet eaters have different, need different procedures? Matt, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I think that um, I think that the quote unquote dumping syndrome that people do see in, um, in, in the gastric bypass is a good thing. Um, and so people say, oh, I don't wanna have dumping. I'm like, well, actually most of my patients like it. Um, it, they like the fact that it reminds them not to eat the wrong things and they're not, they're not even interested in them anymore. So to me, I think that makes a difference. Some people say that any sweet eaters, you shouldn't be doing things. I think it was a bigger issue with the band before where people would be the, uh, the, the, the sweet sipping. Uh, but to be honest, I don't, I think that the operations change their preference for a lot of these things and the bypass is, is just another one of the mechanisms that makes it a little bit more effective. I think we're out of time. So Imran. Do you want to take us out? Sure. Okay. Again, thanks again, everybody, for everybody's time and participation. This was very lively. Again, thanks for, for everybody's time and good job, Dr. Umar. Good luck wherever you go next year.
or this year, I guess. Thanks <laughs> and again. This will, be, this will be posted on the website, so uh, you'll have many more hits. So thank you all so much, and thanks to Tataryn for supporting your fellow. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Great much. work. Thank you. Hey, Rohan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.